So we're going to be taking our thoughts out of James chapter 3. A very practical message that gets right down to where we all live. It's the matter of controlling the tongue. And uh, so if I get something in your skin this morning, I apologize right up front. It's God's word, not me, doing the speaking. Okay? And uh, let's, with that in mind, let's go to the Lord in prayer and to seek his blessing on our thoughts today. Lord, we do thank you for the wonder of your word, Lord, that we have it in our possession, that we can read it for ourselves, that we can know and understand your wisdom. Lord, we thank you that you've not only provided for us knowledge of how we may get right with you, but also how we can be right with our neighbor. And part of that is learning to control what we say with the words of our mouth. Lord, we pray that as we look into your word today, that you will speak to our hearts, so that we receive it willingly, humbly, ready, Lord, to do whatever it is that you ask of us, that we might honour you with our lives. We thank you for these things. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. There's an old saying that we've all used once, or sooner or later. Sticks and stones may make my bones, but words will never harm me. And I know the saying probably originated with the best of intentions, for the best of reasons, and encouragement. Don't let the unfair, unkind things that people say about you get you down or, get, or, or bother you. <coughs> Just imagine a child coming home from school one day with tears in their eyes and mum asks, well, what's wrong? What's the matter, dear? And, well, little Tommy or little Susie or whoever it was in the playground is calling me names today. And the mum, of course, tries to do what she can to encourage her child. You know, don't let these things bother you. And then repeats the phrase, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never harm me. But is it true, is it really true that words cannot harm? You can heal from a wound caused by a stick or a stone, but sometimes the words that people can say go down very deep, and they can cause wounds that can scar you emotionally or psychologically for a lifetime. Think how just one word can destroy a reputation that's been built up over years and years and years in just a moment. Even if the slander is, is later proven to be completely false, once that seed of doubt has been sown, despite all that you're trying to do to try and clear up the mess, there's always that question that just lurks in the back of your mind. What if? What if? You've heard it said that the pen is mightier than the sword. And words do have power. Words uh, carry weight. They have influence. They can make or break a person's reputation. Wars have been fought over a misspoken word. And now in today's media-driven culture, words have taken on an importance now that they've never had before. One misguided tweet, and you could lose your job. A successful career could be destroyed. Someone can go from being a highly respected member of the community one moment to being an outcast and a pariah the next. After a particularly devastating Twitter campaign, even if it was proven later to be false, people have had to go into hiding to protect themselves and their families from the backlash. You see, so how have things gotten so bad? What's happened to people? Doesn't anyone stop and think anymore before uh, speaking of the consequences of what they've got to say? The old wisdom, at least I was brought up this way, if you don't want your words to come back to haunt you, don't put it into writing. Uh, don't put anything into writing that you might later live to regret. But now, today, when the written word can be carried around the world in seconds, people get on the rage and, and, and post the first thing that pops into their mind without thinking of the consequences. Truth of it is, people haven't changed much at all. They're no worse today than they were in the past. Words have always had power, and there have always been people willing to use the words to hurt or destroy another. <laughs> it's just that today, thanks to technology, there's more opportunity for people to indulge in this behavior. Technology has made it possible for our words to reach a far greater uh, audience than ever before. So words matter. When we come to the Bible, we discover that it's got a lot to say about words too. <coughs> words can be a source of great health and comfort. Proverbs chapter 25 verse 11. A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold and pictures of silver. 
Words can also be used to hurt and destroy. Proverbs 18 verse 8. The words of a talebearer are as wounds that sink deep into the innermost parts of your being. Let's look at our text and see what James has to say. Verse 5, he says, Even so the tongue is a little member, but it boasts great things. Behold, how great a matter a little fire kindles, and the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue amongst our members, that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire of hell. But the tongue... For every kind of beast and of birds and of serpents and things in the sea is tamed and has been tamed of mankind. But the tongue can no man tame. It's an unruly evil full of deadly poison. If James hadn't written this 2,000 years ago, I might have been thought that he uh, had just been himself been the object of a hateful Twitter campaign when he wrote these words. But of course, it's not just social media where words can be used to cause great harm. Even sometimes just as we open our mouths to speak, we have the power to be a help or a hindrance. So what we say is every bit as important as what we do, especially as Christians. Some Christians might cringe from the more obvious sins of the flesh. I'd never do that. But never think twice before engaging in a little bit of gossip, telling an off-color joke or hurling verbal abuse at another. James says in verse 10, Out of the same mouth proceeds blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. The book of James is in many ways a manual on how to live the Christian life. It's full of wise counsel on how Christians should behave. The problem is that too many of us don't take the time to read it. Or when we do, we kind of skim through it. And we think to ourselves, oh yes, I've read that before. I totally agree with all of it. So and so should be this. And we never stop to think that maybe it might be having something, God might be having something to say to us. James does not mince his words. I think you can tell from this passage. It might be a small book in the New Testament, but it packs a powerful punch. <clears throat> we need to pay close attention to what the Bible has to say about Christians, and in particular, in this instance, the words that we speak. James begins this chapter, this little section in his letter on the tongue, by addressing those whose vocation it is directly involved in the use of words, pastor teachers. So I'm, I'm kind of in the spotlight for a minute. But look at verse 1, it says, be, My brethren, be not many masters or teachers, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man, and able also to bridle the whole body. Here we see James speaking of the tongue as an instrument used in instruction for ministering the word of God for the good of the hearer, to strengthen faith and to encourage believers in the ways of the Lord. And we're also here confronted with just how easy it is for us to offend with a misspoken word. James uses the word master or teacher here. Who's he talking about? In the sense in which every believer, every Christian, has a duty to progress in their knowledge and understanding of God's word so that you can share it with others. Matthew chapter 28. Go and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. So there's a sense of that Christ wants us all to be involved in the business of sharing the truth whenever we have opportunity. But of course here in the text, James in chapter 3 verse 1 is talking primarily about ministers of the word, pastor teachers, as they're called in Ephesians 4.11. And he's saying don't be quick, too quick to elevate yourself to such a position. With the honour of the position there also comes greater responsibility. God will hold ministers of his word to a higher standard. You fail in that responsibility and you will receive the greater condemnation. Teachers will be judged by a higher standard than the hearer. In Luke chapter 12, verse 48, Jesus laid down the timeless principle that unto whomsoever much is given, much shall be required. To whom men have committed much of him, they will ask the more. So what a pastor does, what a pastor says, can have an influence on another life. It can have 
an influence for all eternity. <coughs> so words are important. What you say. It's been said that some people will reject a bushel of truth because it contains one grain of error, and others will swallow a bushel of error because it contains one grain of truth. So when your job is to communicate the Word of God, you've got to be doubly sure that what you say is true and right. I used to be a teacher, that's what I trained for, I have my degrees in history and uh, languages. And I was a high school teacher for many years before I went into the ministry. And of course, history and English, that's what I taught, I felt were very important. You need to know these things. And uh, I would give tests, obviously, as you do, and you want your children to do the best they can to test. And so they can, you know, graduate from high school, maybe go on to university, get a good job, these things are important. And I knew it, and I enjoyed teaching. But I was also very much aware that um, most of the students might do, learn what they need to do to pass the test, and if you were to ask them a couple of questions a couple of days later, they forgot most everything that they had answered on the test. And you know, it's, it's okay. You can actually get through life not being able to recall the year in which the Battle of Hastings was fought, and you'll be okay. Unless you're a high school teacher of history. <laughs> but when I became a pastor, what I had to say took on completely different meaning. Because it wasn't so much now just teaching them to get through the next test. What I have to say is being faithful to God's Word can affect people's lives for all eternity. If the pastor or teacher is fulfilling his vocation before God and man as he should, well, it involves a lot of study and preparation. Second uh, <clears throat> Timothy chapter 2, verse 15 encourages us to study, to be diligent, put some effort, time into studying, rightly dividing the word of truth. Preach the word, be instant, in season, out of season, rebuke, rebuke, reprove, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. First Peter chapter 5 says, feed or care for the flock of God, taking the oversight thereof not uh, because you have to, but willingly, not for filthy lucre or for dishonest gain, but with a readiness to minister. Not lording it over others, but being an example. And so James says in verse 1, My brethren, be not many masters. Stop becoming many masters. It seems there was a spirit abroad in some of the churches in the early New Testament days where individuals were competing to be the top dog. What does that have to do with the spirit of Christ? Where's the calling of God in any of that? Jesus said, if you want to be, learn to be a leader among men, then you must first learn to be a servant. Now, I know in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 1, we are encouraged to aspire to the office of a pastor or a teacher. Yes, that's true. But individuals can aspire to these positions for their own reasons. And so James warns us, be not many masters. We should rather strive to be good listeners of the word. And then to be doers of the word and not hearers only. James 1.22 Not only can individuals aspire to be teachers of the word for the wrong reasons, but teachers can misuse the pulpit. I've seen it done. The pulpit should never be used as a platform to address personal grievances or vendettas. Any time that someone steps into the pulpit to minister the word of God, they should have a, a deep sense of responsibility that they do justice to the truth and to honour God. It's easy when your job is to, to study the Word of God critically that you become critical of others. And so James says in verse 2, in many things we offend all. And I don't take James's humility here because he includes himself in it. He says we offend all. Ministers are not perfect people. We get it wrong. We need to be aware of our limitations and do everything we can to guard against the pitfalls and the temptations associated with our ministry. R.B.G. Tasker, someone who knew a lot about teaching God's Word, said that teachers of the Word are continually engaged in passing judgments, both moral and intellectual. The very nature of their work makes them critical, sometimes severely critical. And so we must guard against that tendency. Jesus once said that he that is without sin amongst you, let him cast the first stone. That includes ministers of the word. A teacher ought to judge him or herself first before they ever take it upon themselves to seek to instruct others. We need to deal with the wooden beam that's sticking out of our own eyes 
before we take someone else to task for the speck of dust that's in their own. The Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 2 verse 1 chides the self-righteous critic. He says, who do you think you are to set yourself up in judgment over another? Be careful how severely you judge others because you'll be judged by the same measure. Well, I've done preaching myself uh, for today. I'm going to move on now to what James has to say to us all about our words. Look at verse 3. <clears throat> Behold, we put bits in the horse's mouths that they may obey us, and we turn about the whole body. Behold also the ships, which though they be so great and are driven of fierce winds, yet are they turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listeth or wishes. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. Behold how great a matter a little fire kindles. <coughs> First thing I notice here is that James uses three different illustrations to make his point. Each illustration he chose for a reason. Each of these pictures helps to illustrate a different aspect of the kind of influence, the kind of power that our words can have. Firstly, the bit in the horse. It says in verse 3, we put bits in the horse's mouths that they may obey us, and we turn about the whole body. What do you notice about this picture? Is it speaks of the controlling influence our words can have. No matter how big the horse, it's the person sitting in the saddle pulling the reins that influences the direction the horse takes. This is also true of anyone in a position of authority. It could be a parent dealing with a child. It could be a teacher in the classroom, your boss at work. They're in a position of authority. What they have to say carries weight. If they tell you to do something, by and large, you kind of need to do it. There's a controlling aspect to what they have to say. And with that authority comes great responsibility not to misuse that power. So the tongue, it has a controlling influence. Verse 4 talks about ships. Behold also the ships, which though they be so great and are driven of fierce winds, yet are they turned about with a very small helm. You know there's some massive ships out there. Um, last year we were in the States for my son's wedding. And uh, we had uh, a couple of days, we were going to go down and see my parents in Florida. Uh, Marcia and I stopped off at Savannah, Georgia, just for a couple of nights by ourselves. Savannah sits right on the sea. It's a, a large international port. We were walking down by the river when one of these immense container ships came out of port and began making its way out to sea. And uh, from a distance it looked, you know, you see it, but as it got closer and closer and closer, it just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger until it was passing right beside us. They were immense. It towered over all the buildings there on the waterfront. It was a huge thing. Uh, when I was in grad school, I lived uh, two blocks away from the largest naval base in the world. And uh, to get to my campus, I had to actually drive through the naval base. At any given time, there were one or two aircraft carrier groups there. And uh, again, immense ships. Where I went to church, many of the men were in the Navy. And uh, I got to go have a tour, a personal tour, of one of the aircraft carriers, the USS Eisenhower. Again, an immense ship entire floating city. I forget how many, I think there was 3,000 list men on the ship, but it could carry up to five or 6,000 people at a given time at sea. And uh, we went up onto the flight deck, I forget how many football fields. Immense amount of space. Huge thing. And then they took us into uh, the, 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 uh, the uh, I don't know what you call it, the cabin where they control the ship. The bridge. The bridge. <laughs> I'm trying to say cockpit, that's a plane. The bridge. <laughs> Um, and we get into the bridge, and of course, there's the steering wheel. It was about this big. That immense ship, guided through the seas with all the forces, guided by this little tiny helm. As massive as these ships are, uh, they, they are, are controlled by the smallest of wheels, the helm. And this speaks to us, again, the guiding power of the word. What immense influence we can exert for others, for good or for ill with the words that we say. You know, we're often too quick to give advice. Something comes to the question, it might be just something as simple about where to go on holiday, what to see, or it could be something more serious. You know, there's probably someone going through a problem with their personal relationship, and we tell them what they need to do. And then later we learn a little bit more about them in the situation, and we wish we could take the words back. 
You know, we, gave them, we sent them in the wrong direction. We need to be careful what we say because words have a guiding influence. And then in verse 5, there's the illustration of the spark of fire. Even so the tongue is a little member and boasteth great things. Behold, how great a matter a little fire kindles. Several years ago, um, my kids were, we drove through Yellowstone National Park. We planned this trip for, for, for weeks. It's the first time we've been out west, uh, my favorite part of the country. And it's um, been a long time, so, uh, long time since I've been out west. I'm looking forward to it with great business. But as we made our way across, we learned there were forest fires that had uh, taken hold in Yellowstone National Park. They just shut the park down. So we kept wondering, what do we do? And the way we planned our trip, there's not that many roads out in that part of the world. It's quite wild in places. And the only way for us to get to our hotel that night, we had to go through the National Park. And it was closed. So, but we were told that um, the wind changing direction and that uh, possibly they might open the eastern entrance. And if that were the case, then we, we, we could uh, get to our hotel for the night. So we thought we'd just go anyways. We got there in the morning and we were backed up. Um, trying to get him sat for a couple hours before they opened the park, but they did let us in. And uh, we kept waiting and kept waiting, which is fine. The Yellowstone was beautiful. We enjoyed all the beautiful scenery. But eventually we got word that at 6 p.m. that night they were going to open the eastern gate and they let us through. So we began driving towards the gate. We began driving through the part of the forest that had gone up in flames. It was like going through a post-apocalyptic post movie. Uh, the whole forest was black. The ground was black, there were no trees, just kind of the columns of blackened uh, trunks left of the trees, still flames of fire all around us, smoke everywhere. We could see, we actually saw uh, a single like, deer kind of by themselves wandering through the forest, completely disorientated. It was quite distressing, and our, our kids were watching all this and uh, kind of wish they hadn't seen it. And uh, Ian got really concerned that, uh, especially when he saw the little deer running through the forest, he said, let's pray and ask that God would send some rain. And she said, okay. So we started praying, and uh, I kid you not, before we got out of the forest, the thunderclouds that had built up opened up. The rest of the night we drove through uh, 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 an almighty downpour and it rained. And uh, uh, so Ian was pleased, God heard and answered our prayers. But um, the forest, and we were told that it'll take at least 10 years for the forest to recover, for the green shoots to start coming, but it'll take up to 100 years before the forest ever gets back to what it was before the fire. Most forest fires begin with just something small, it could be a lightning strike, or a cigarette that has been discarded quite often times that's caused the fires out west. There's the famous Great Fire of London that uh, raged for several days across the city in 1666. Again, thankfully, there was relatively small loss of life. But 13,500 homes, over 80 churches, 44 businesses, a palace, several prisons, and the old St. Paul's Cathedral were destroyed by the fire. All because of a small spark in a bakery in Puddin Lane. Now, we all live in a small town here in Eyemouth. I don't need to tell you how quickly a story can spread its way across town. When we first moved here, our family, we came with our three children. We were living up uh, in the Dean Head housing estate. And uh, we bought the house here on uh, Upper Humble, where we live now. Slightly bigger house. Kids were growing up and we thought we need to have some room. The rumor went around town that the reason we bought the house is because Marcy was expecting another child. <laughs> It wasn't true. Um, there was no harm done with that piece of falsehood. We got a lot of laughs out of that one. But how often, though, does something damaging or hurtful about someone spread like wildfire across town? It turns out to be false. But the effort that it takes to try and correct the damage done, and some people will never fully accept the truth. So James here speaks of the power that words can have the power can be used in one of two ways. It can be good for ill, it can be used for good, or it can be used for ill. What are some of the good things that we can speak about? What well, we can offer to comfort. We can use our tongues to offer comfort to someone who's sad or lonely, to encourage the downcast heart. We can inspire others to positive action, to, to serve one another in humility and in grace. 
We can speak the truth in love. We can seek to be a blessing, to, to be an encouragement to others. We can use our words to pray and to praise God. To praise God. We can teach and discuss and share the Word of God. We can share the Gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ with us. These are the good things that we can do with our mouths. Proverbs chapter 15 and verse 23 says, A man hath joy by the answer of his mouth. And a word spoken in due season, how good it is. Have you ever been in a conversation and you've been able to say just the right thing at the right moment and everybody was delighted? How good you felt for that contribution in the conversation? Uh, what you pleased that you had a positive effect uh, on those around you by what you had to say? And that's what the writer of the prophet here is talking about. You can receive joy for the things that you say. The power of your words for good. But similarly, your words can be instruments of evil, to sow discord and doubt, to cause harm on others. Earlier, James talked about the guiding influence our words can have. Have you ever been in a conversation and it's been a pleasant and enjoyable conversation? Everybody's relaxed, you're having a good time, there's positive vibes everywhere. And then someone injects a sour note into the conversation. They complain about something maybe they were unhappy about. Maybe a bit of gossip about so and so and somebody else picks up on it. What happens? That conversation that was so pleasant suddenly veers off in another direction. One thoughtless word gives rise to another and before long a sour mood prevails over the one present. The direction by one word. Long ago, the Israelites had been enslaved in the land of Egypt. Long had they cried out to God for deliverance. And then the day came when God answered their prayers. He sent them a deliverer, the man Moses. And he, by the power of God, led the children of Israel out of slavery, through the wilderness, to the land that God had promised them. And now the children of Israel come to the promised land. They're camped along the borders. They stood ready at last to enter into the land of promise, that land flowing with milk and honey. And the people lost their nerve. God had led them all the way. He led them against every odd. He provided for them each step of the way. But now that they stood there, on the brink of blessing, they wavered. They weren't sure what was waiting for them around the corner. They didn't know what they were up against. And so they implored Moses, would you send some spies into the land to, to check it out for us before we enter? Moses agreed. One representative from each of the twelve tribes of Israel was chosen. And they went into the land to scout it out. And then they were to come back to bring the people a report of what they'd seen. So they spent 40 days just doing that. Covering, crisscrossing the land, exploring the length and breadth of the land. And when they returned, to give the report. The initial report was positive. To the spies, Joshua and Caleb stood up and they gave a glory report. It's a beautiful land. We've seen it with our own eyes. It's fruitful. It's abundant. And they rejoiced in God's blessings. And they were encouraging the people. Let's go up and enter into the land. With confidence. God's brought us this far. He's not going to forsake us now. Then the other ten spies got up. They agreed. The land was indeed a fair land. Just as God had promised. A land flowing with milk and honey. You can imagine the excitement as the people are hearing the message. And they're all saying, oh, how good, 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 God. Let's not wait. Let's go in. Let's not wait a moment longer. But then the other ten spies injected a note of discouragement. They said that the inhabitants of the land were powerful. The cities were well fortified. The people who lived in the land were strong and well armed. And we were like grasshoppers in their sight. We don't stand a chance against them. It's hopeless. We'll never make it. It's a lost cause. And the mood of the people instantly fell. And they began to complain to Moses, Why you brought us here only to die? And they began to complain to God, Why did you bring us all the way through the wilderness just so we die? Joshua and Caleb, they tried to encourage the people, Don't doubt. Trust in God. He's not failed you. He won't fail you now. But it was too late. The word of discouragement had been spoken. A seed of doubt had been sown. There was nothing now that Joshua or Caleb or even Moses himself could say that would convince the people otherwise. Verse 5. Oh, the tongue is a little member, but it boasts great things. Behold, how great a matter a little fire kindles. 
How much harm, how much evil can result from a misspoken word? Is it any wonder the scriptures tell us, do not be rash with your mouth, nor let your heart be hasty to utter a word before God. For God is in heaven and you are on earth, therefore let your words be few. Proverbs 29 verse 11, a fool utters all his mind, but a wise man keeps it until afterwards. You know the saying, it comes from that. It's better to keep your mouth closed and let people think you're a fool than to open your mouth and remove all doubt. <laughs> Someone once came across this following epitaph on a tombstone. Beneath this sod, a lump of clay, lies Arabella Young, who, on the 24th of May, began to hold her tongue. <laughs> so we see the danger of an unguarded tongue and, the tongue, and, and of course, the harm that it can cause. But James isn't finished yet. Look what he goes to say in verse 6. He says the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. Verse 5, he speaks of a little fire. In verse 6, he speaks of the blaze that it's become, the damage that just one small spark can cause. So we told the minister many years ago, the time that he was traveling down uh, on a road alongside the, the Hackensack River in New York State. And he came to a point where the New York and Erie Railroad crossed the river. Alongside the track, just before uh, 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 it crossed the bridge, was a sign which read, Shut your ash pan. He initially wondered what the singular and impertinent counsel could mean. Those were his words. But then he looked more closely. The bridge and realized the reason for the sign. The bridge was made of wood. And a, a burning coal that might accidentally fall out of an open ash pan uh, and fell onto the bridge could cause a great fire. It could burn the bridge down. It would disrupt travel. It could put the potential of putting many lives into danger. And of course, not to mention the, the huge financial cost of having to rebuild the bridge. So the sign that said, shut your ash pan, was appropriate advice. Think of the ways in which you speak to others. Think of how much harm can result from your words. Think of the verbal abuse we might level at a spouse or a child or someone in the workplace. When you find the rage or feel the rage building up inside of you, you're preparing to lash out and cut someone down to size with an angry or a hurtful word. Remember this advice to shut your ash pan. <laughs> Verse 7 and 8. For every kind of beast and a bird and a serpent and things in the sea is tamed and hath been tamed of mankind, but the tongue can no man tame. It's an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. Whenever I read these verses, I think of a horse. A horse is the most impressive animal. It's when you stand up next to one that you realize just how big they are and what a powerful creature they really are. It's a powerful animal. A horse could kill you with just one kick. And yet, if that horse has been tamed, a little child can walk up to it, stroke it on the neck and feed it out of its hand. James says here that in contrast to the tame horse, the tongue is something that no one can tame. And it's true, by ourselves in our strength, we struggle to control our tongues. No matter how hard we may try, there are those moments when we forget ourselves and we say something that we wish we hadn't. That something later we regret. We might not be able to tame our tongues, but James tells us there is a way. Look back at chapter 1 and verse 26. <clears throat> Here James is talking about our words once more. He says, if any man among you seem to be religious and bridles not his tongue, but disease his own heart, this man's religion is vain. And what James is doing here is drawing a link between your ability to control your tongue and the genuineness or the reality of your faith. Look back at verse 19, chapter 1. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. So lay apart all filthiness and uh, superfluity of God. It's not a fancy phrase, but all that uh, wickedness that can uh, uh, accumulate in your life. Get rid of it and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. 
and be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving your own selves. The secret to controlling your tongue is the condition of your heart. It's out of the abundance of the heart that the mouth speaks. The control of the tongue begins with a heart made right with God. James says, receive with meekness, with humility, with contrition of spirit, the word of God which is able to save your souls. You need to come in humility and in faith and receive the word of God into your heart. The trouble with many of us is that we're trying to do the right thing, but we're trying to do it in our own strength. But if the Bible teaches us anything, it teaches us this. We can't do it on our own. The missing ingredient in so many lives today is the Holy Spirit. It's only when the Lord takes up His rightful place in your heart that things begin to fall into place in your life. He's the one that can give you the strength to do right. He's the one that can help you to be what God wants you to be. So let's look back at our text in, in chapter 3. James has been pointing out, as we said, the dangers of an uncontrolled tongue. But as you read on through the chapter, you realize that an uncontrolled tongue is only the outward manifestation of a deeper problem. That deeper problem is the heart. A heart that's not right with God. A heart that's not been filled with the wisdom of that comes from above. Look at chapter, uh, verse 14. If you have bitter envy and strife in your hearts, glory not, lie not against the truth. This wisdom descends not from above, but it's earthly, essential, it's of the flesh, devilish. For wherever envying and strife is, there's confusion in every evil work. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits without partiality and without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. When we come to Jesus in faith and we let him take control of our lives, he starts rolling up his sleeves and goes to work, remaking, reshaping, remolding you, transforming you into his likeness. In Psalm 141, David prayed, Set a watch, O Lord, before my mouth. Keep the door of my lips. Incline not my heart to any evil thing. Let's be conscious of the words that we speak and the power that they can have for good or for ill. Let's always seek to honor God. Not only in what we say, but in how we say it. Before you speak, ask yourself the following questions. Is it true? Is it loving? Is it necessary? Is it true? Do you know that it's true? Is it loving? Am I saying this because I love that person? Is it necessary? Is it something that must be said? Is it something that must be said now? Or could it wait till later? Or maybe it shouldn't be said at all? Is it true? Is it loving? Is it necessary? Before you speak, pray. Seek God's guidance. Fill your mind with God's word and God's word will fill your mouth. And if all else fails, ask yourself, what would Jesus do? Just a few thoughts then on the words of our mouths. May God use this to be a help to us and to you in your lives. And may we go out and shine with the light of the Lord Jesus in all that we do and say. Let's take our hymn.